evening, everyone. Welcome to the first Harris <coughs> County Harris County Historical Society meeting. My name is Ann, and I'm president of the Harris County Historical Society this term. Very grateful to be here, and I am just so happy to see all of you. It was uh, I was kind of concerned when COVID hit us and. The board and I, we've worked really hard on keeping in touch with you and trying to further our mission, which is to keep Houston history alive. So our topic tonight is Houston 1860 and on to 1900. It is truly my favorite time period in Houston. I wrote a book once about this time period and my challenge was the fact that a lot, even a lot of my colleagues felt that there was nothing going on here then but I knew differently and I was really happy to share that. So the photographs you're going to see tonight, I'd say 80% of them are primary source photographs from families that I've worked with. And I just really truly am fascinated by this time period. I love Victorian time period. Well, we'll start the picture you're seeing right now. We'll talk about at the very end of the meeting. This is uh, the house family the female members of the house family. And um, sorry, I just, someone just did something in chat and I got distracted. Female members of the house family sitting on the front lawn at 1010 Louisiana. And a total, we will have a little bit in a few minutes, a look inside their house and the story behind them. But I just adore this photograph and thought it really, it really brought Houston, genteel Houston to mind. Okay, I am. All right, let's talk a little about 1860 in Houston. The population, as you can see here, what was 4,000, about almost 5,000 people. And that decade we dealt with the yellow fever epidemic that caused the death of William Marsh Rice's first wife. And uh, of course, the Civil War came up. Buffalo Bayou steamboat era reaches its zenith this decade. The richest man in the country is William Marsh Rice. One of his several businesses was hauling ice to Houston from New England by ship. Over 115,000 bales of cotton passed through the city. Houston was a growing rail center with five short rail lines and over 350 miles of track leading to the city, out of the city by 1864. At least nine Houston merchants reported taxable holdings of over $250,000 and the city experienced two disastrous fires, one destroying $350,000 worth of property. Now, a real a little sideline real quick is the fact that prior to the fires in the, this decade, the city did not have many regulations on how to build. And after the devastation, they changed to build, to use brick in their buildings and not the wooden that they'd used before that. So where would you have walked and who would you have passed and what did Houston look like between 1860 and 1870? Here you are, Market Square. Gail Miller has an incredible collection of beautiful um, postcards. And this is one that I especially like. <laughs> I just got a note from someone that William Morris Rice was the richest man in our city, not in our county. There you go. So Market Square 9, 1860 looked like this. As you can see, it's wagons, horses, no, it's like some wooden streets. Market Square bound by Travis, Milam, Congress, and Preston was donated to the city by the Allen family. And this photo shows an open air market, people dropping off their wares. The location of the cross, this location right here is across from where Lock Raft is right now. And Lock Raft stands as one of the oldest structures in the city of Houston. Right, and right now it's named Hearsay, not Lock Raft. 
Any day while shopping for goods on this little street here, you might bump into William Thomas M. Bagby. Now, Mr. Bagby was a giant in Houston for the time period he lived. As you can see, he died in 1868, so he didn't live too long, but his impact on the city has been well felt. He's his home on Bagby Street is where the Julia Ideson building is right now. And he was a Houston businessman and civic leader born in Virginia. He arrived in Texas in 1837 and within three years, he was a prosperous cotton merchant. He was one of nine original members of Houston Public Library. And the Julia Ideson building stands on the former Bagby home, the entire block. In 1866, he helped found the Houston Direct Navigation Company to promote barge transport of cotton and improve bio navigation. In 1867, he was put in the position as president of the First National Bank and his friend and business associate was B.A. Shepard. Now B.A. Shepard was quite the man he was born in Virginia in 1814, and he was probably the argu was arguably the most prominent and enduring money lender in early Houston. Now he started his own bank, and his own bank he called Shepherd's Bank, and Shepherd's Bank was in, was was in. Pro Sorry, Shepherd's Bank was what they he did business with until 1867 when he blended with First National Bank in Houston. That's a picture of the First National Bank in 1902. Now, the interesting thing about B.A. Shepherd, that most of these gentlemen went by T.W. House, B.A. Shepherd, T.M. Bagby. But the most interesting thing about Benjamin A. Shepherd was. He was about, he was a handsome man, but he money. He printed his own money with his picture on it. Here's a sample of his bank notes. He was very, very sharp and you'll notice his tan writing is interesting. Real small. In 1866, state and nationally chartered banks were sanctioned for the first time in Texas. The B.A. Shepard was hailed as one of the first bankers in Houston. He became aware of the impending opening of the First National Bank and he merged his private bank. And this was one of the first national bank in 1867. This is what it looked like when they did a, they did transactions. And his, he's withdrawing money for family expenses, $25. And this is courtesy of the Heritage Society. The photographs I'm using are, um, you will see where I get them in case you ever wanna use them for your own presentations. One of my very favorite men and families, by the way, is the Cushing family. During the 1860s, the local newspaper was called the Telegraph. E.H. Cushing, born in Vermont and arrived in Houston in 1856. And eventually he became the third editor and owner of the Texas Telegraph or the Telegraph. During the Civil War, we were having a hard and so he ran out of paper. So he went as far as to print his, the Telegraph on butcher's paper and wallpaper to keep the presses running. He wanted to get that information out there. Matilda Burke was his devoted wife, and she was also the daughter of the Reconstruction Mayor, A.J. A. Burke, the mayor that took over in 1879. Huge family, all of these people are buried in Glenwood, right near the house, the old, right near where Dick Ambrose works in the little white house. This, this sweet little boy is Edward Benjamin Cushing. He attended Texas A&M in 1880 and is credited with saving it 32 years later. In 1912, Cushing stood alone against the nearly overwhelming forces attempting to close the tiny 
Agriculture and Mechanical College of Texas. He guaranteed Texas A&M's notes with his own personal funds to obtain credit so that the school could remain in operation. His extensive engineering book collection was donated to what eventually was named the Cushy Memorial Library. Now, they were quite the family and had a very famous place that people would go to to meet interesting people. This is Bohemia. Newspaper man Cushing and Associates were hot. He was a highly educated man and really promoted uh, education, pro education. Now, I don't know if all of you know of the poet laureate Molly Moore, but she came from Tyler, Texas to study under his, to study under him and later became published. In fact, she wrote one of the first, one of the first textbooks that we were using in our schools here. She also became the poet laureate of Texas, and that was a huge honor for a woman at that point. At Bohemia, the Ten Acre Estate, the Cushings held regular salons and entertained the likes of Ashbel Smith, Sam Houston, and of course, Molly Moore Davis. Their home was in the country near today's Houston Community College, near the corner of San Jacinto and Holman. A Northern reporter in an article titled, The Garden of Bohemia, a charming resort of the literati of Texas. Knowing, signing it only as Anna S.D., she recalled seeing the gardens and wrote, a, and pro, wrote that she pro, preposterously gushed about the roses of Bohemia. She was invited to attend an event and she said, Mr. Cushing said to me, there is a lot of Bohemians coming out to our home this evening at five o'clock to have tea on the lawn and we want you. And she went on to describe what it was like. Now five o'clock in Texas means <clears throat> any hour from five to eight. So it's almost dusk before all the party gathered on the ivy clad gallery. The gardens of Bohemia, it is extensive laid out with paths that wind into all sorts of shady nooks, while beneath trees here and there are placed seats so strongly suggestive of a tete -te that you can't help sitting down. If you have any companion with you who is fit for such an enjoyment. And then she ended her article with this really interesting line or two that I feel kind of makes sense when no one told me much happened during Reconstruction Houston, and here's what she writes about visiting Bohemia. To hear Northern people talk, they would fancy Texas a land of barbarians utterly ignorant of civilization. I wish such infatuated individuals would have been with me Thursday evening at Bohemia. I have searched high and low for a picture of her or anything else she would have written to no avail, but I will continue to search for that. Now, the, this is a stagecoach in 1869 that is carrying a darling little couple, Ruth and Thomas W. House Jr. after their marriage from Bastrop to Houston. The significance of this photograph, which is just incredible, is that it is a carte de vest, and the carte de vest are photographs from the 1860s. They're like a little, they're a card, and it's a paper card, and people would use them as visiting. They, it's kind of like business cards are used today. But you can see even this extremely faded action shot. Can you imagine taking that? I found this, a friend of mine, Sally Kate Marshall, uh, Weems, Sally Kate Marshall Weems, yes. Sally Kate Marshall Weems, whose mother happened to be a coach at Lamar and Lanier, she uh, asked me into her home and allowed me to scan most of her primary source uh, TW House imagery. And this was one I, I honestly could not believe seeing quite a picture like this from that time period. Normally, the carte de visa I, were from, I was familiar with were mainly um portraits and things so 
this is just quite something. Now, you know, of course, that if, when you're riding between Bastrop and Houston after getting married that day, you're in for a 10 hour drive through dust <laughs> and heat and being bounced all around. And within that 10 hour drive, you may be stopping at the eight hour mark to get the uh, horses changed out because they kind of topped out depending on how fast you were driving at about eight miles. There she is. Now, I don't know how many of you have looked at a whole lot of imagery from that time period, but she is such a natural beauty. And there's her husband, T.W. House Jr. T.W. House Jr. is the son of T.W. House Sr., <laughs> who was a huge figure in Houston. He came here as a baker in about the 1840s and just did everything here. And I, I know some of you may be familiar with him. Ruth Nicholson House married banker T.W. House Jr. and her devotion to Houston and the well-being of its citizens accompanied by the House family fortune made our current YMCA possible. She gathered her female friends together and they just did huge things for the population and the, the poorer population in the town. Now, the House family had a gardener and his name was James Gogan and he called himself the House Yardman. So I found his last name because I went to the 1870 census and just scoured for it, for the name of the person that was living with them at that time period. Well, you're not gonna believe this, but Sarah Duncan provided to me a 24 page document that James wrote about his time with the House family. He wrote it in 1895 when he was 30 years old and had been with them the entire 30 years. So I'd like to tell you what he said about Mrs. House. He said, Mrs. T.W. House, as I knew her, the perfect lady, kind, generous, charitable to the extreme. She lived to do good. No one came to her for aid, was turned away empty handed. She would give me money to go to the store to fill baskets and take to some needy families. She would visit them earlier to see what they needed. She had a lot of children. She had a huge house to take care of, but she was very kind. Now, T.W. House Jr. was the son of a giant among the giants of early Houston. He too was a success story. He was a Houston millionaire and immensely popular in businessman. His directory listing in 1870 shows him as an owner of a private bank. The houses also had the house bank. He was a cotton broker and he was president of the Houston Gas Light Company, Houston Water Company, Houston East and Texas Railroad, and he was also on the Houston City Council. Now the yard man James had this to say about Mr. House and I just love to imagine what this next paragraph says, because it's just awesome to think about. It says, my hobby, also the hobby of Mr. House, a great lover of flowers. He was an expert. I thought he knew something about growing and tending to them. He loved chrysanthemum and had a large collection of them with canvas. They would cover it with canvas when it would get cold. It was his delight to return from business daily to go on his flower trail before entering his home. If you take that in for a second, that's just a beautiful thought. And his plumbagos were his very favorite. Well, now we're coming into the 1870s. As you can see, the population has almost doubled from almost 5,000 to almost 10,000. We actually have refrigerated railroad cars and the Texas State Fair came to Houston. Harris County itself had only 64 manufacturing establishments and 583 laborers. Eureka Mills, a $125,000 textile factory 
opened five miles northwest of the city near the intersection of 610 and Memorial. Congregation Beth Israel established the first synagogue in Houston at Franklin and Crawford. And the first 300 Chinese immigrant laborers arrived in Houston. And at the, during the 1870s, we were readmitted, Texas was readmitted to the Union. This is a picture of the of one page of the 24 page document written by Gardner James, family Gardner James. He did not use a whole lot of punctuation, but had a really nice way of turning a phrase. And through every line came the total admiration and, and happiness with which he lived at that house with the house family. I think all of you recognize this. <laughs> I love all the, I guess all, you guys are all seeing the comments on the thing. I, I'm glad when someone makes a comment, it's pretty interesting. I cannot wait to discuss them all. <laughs> okay, this um, pictures of the wood map, the 1869 wood map. I am showing it today to just kind of show you the way all of the homes near the confluence of the two bios are set out in blocks. And what was really interesting, I mean, full square blocks, what's interesting is a lot of the houses were on a full block. They, 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 um, each home, especially towards the bios confluences, occupy a full block. And this was the case with 1010 Louisiana. The gardener described it as it had every single vegetable known to the time period. Its trees were 50 feet high. And look how beautiful this is. And look what extremely, an extremely clear and tight picture. Now, I, that can be looked at even larger and you can actually see someone standing on the balcony there when you pull it up. This is another one that came from Sally Kate and I'm forever very grateful to her. Now it would have been impossible to successfully run a home as large as a house residence without several employees. In their archives and scrapbooks, the pictures of Minerva Gamble and Eliza Scott were among those pasted in for safekeeping. James Goggin, in his diary, allows us to go in to the goings on of this household through his description of Aunt Liza. And that is Eliza Scott, the woman on your right. The kitchen or cook room, and here's his thing presided over by Aunt Liza, a wonderful chef, especially the making of waffles. The kitchen would be a blackout, so much that you could not see the waffle maker, but delightful were the waffles. They would melt in the mouth, so crispy, never have I seen their equal. Mrs. House would send me to packing house for small pig, 15 or 20 pounds. Aunt Liza would place it in the oven, wood, not gas, as she cared not to be up to date, to be in an up-to-date style. The pig would come from over, would come out over golden brown with an apple in its mouth. So with all her cooking delightful to the appetite, faithful she was. Aunt Liza, good nature, raised the children until growing. She was with the House family for a century or thereabouts. Mrs. House would tell Aunt Liza, put a loaf of bread on in James' house. James lived on the property in an old wooden cabin until it was hurt in one of the storms pretty bad and the house family then made him a two-story wooden structure to live in that was just to his delight. It was a beautiful house and here's what the parlor looked like. And what's interesting about T.W. House Jr. On the left, he's sitting there with his profile. And then the next is Ruth, his wife, and then his daughters, Ellen, Mary, and Edith. 
T.W. House was, uh, of course, president of the Houston Gas Natural Gas Company. And so you'll see the gas light that comes down from the ceiling to the mahogany table. From this day forward, or from probably 10 years post this photograph, he is always seen in, um, in profile because uh, the family members told me that he um, had been hunting, jumped a fence, and his gun discharged and really hurt his face. So he never again was photographed without his profile. But you can see the luxurious um, Victorian style of their house. <laughs> I'm getting a kick out of everyone's comments. Sorry about that. I had to pause for a second. <laughs> okay, here we go. Yeah. We're now into 1880. Okay, do you see that we are no, now we're at 16,000 people living here? We have a fire. We have, we have a firehouse, post office, a designer jail, grocery stores, and wow! Can you believe ready-made clothing? <clears throat> the first telephone exchange is installed in the 1880s, and there were only 50 telephones. Congress appropriates fifty thousand dollars finally to get the ship channel improved. The first electric streetcars installed at Maine and Preston. The Houston Chronicle is established and the rail link between Houston and New Orleans is completed. And the very first scheduled pass passenger train between the two cities makes its run. So you've, you've met Mr. Bagby, Benjamin Shepard, E.H. and Matilda Cushing and their son, Edward. Ruth and T.W. House Jr. and James Minerva and Aunt Liza Scott of the House household. And you may remember that in the 1860s, the city experienced two disastrous fires, one destroying $350,000 worth of property. So Houstonians by this time had graduated from bucket brigades as a method of putting out fires to brick and mortar fire departments. And here is firehouse number five. It was held at McKinney and Nance. And the gentlemen actually had their, when they were on their shifts, they would sleep in this dormitory. And you don't see it, but what it was, the dormitory was on the top floor and they had one of the pools, they would just, oh, you see it on the right-hand side, slide down to the, but this was quite an advance for our firefighting. <laughs> okay. So what was really so interesting about the jail is that they hired architect Eugene T. Heiner to design it. And he, by this time, was already pretty successful and had designed all kinds of things throughout the, the um, Texas, actually. The Harris County Jail was built at 403 Caroline Street and was designed by the renowned Eugene Heiner. He was hired to built many buildings throughout Houston and had a very long and successful career. In, and the 1879 post office was designed by the US Treasury architects in a Moorish design. And when it was in, built, it was the only building in that style in the city or one of the few. Try to never say only when you're doing history say one might be one of or one of. <laughs> okay, so you could no longer did you have to do everything at home, you could go to Hinky and Pilot at the corner of Congress and Milam. And this is what it looked like. And I know a lot of you may have already seen the picture on the right. But have you seen the picture of uh, the way the men were that were working inside it? Boy, did you get some incredible attention when you had to go there to get waited on? 
Uh, I'm taking a little technical break and plugging in my computer. I told you this. I told you all it was our first run. I'm teasing. <laughs> okay, there we go. That that was a disaster. Like it might have been a real disaster, but it wasn't. Okay, so then the pilots were French French immigrants, and um, and white. Eugene Pilot is the picture down in the corner is Eugene Pilot and his he owned the Sweeney um, Sweeney Combs Opera House and brought a lot of culture to Houston. But they their family was so kind the descendants of their family donated their residence to the Heritage Society downtown at Sam Houston Park. And that that is, there's a point I want to come to right now also at the the Harris County Historical Society versus the Heritage Society, we're two different organizations and um, we all support each other. We were formed in 1923 and later we'll tell you all about that, not tonight, but later. But we often get, because the names are so similar, we often get mixed, but we are very grateful to be able to talk about them tonight and show this picture of the one of their donors and lovely. The, this is Abe Levy. The Levy brothers, Abe Levy came from Prussia. His parents were immigrants from Prussia and they came here and opened a small mercantile business. And he lived with them and worked with them and went to private schools in Houston. He was actually a Houston native. His first job was with Foley Brothers downtown, and he worked there as a clerk. And when he came of age, he and his brother opened their own business. And this is a really cool vision of what it's like to, uh, what a Victorian workroom at a, a mercantile place would be like. If you notice, um, I don't think you can see that, that, that well on this, but the only running water they have in the picture on the right is a bucket by the mirror back there. And they have, um, you can see they're working with um, no electricity and, and, um, and Abe Levy's building that he owned was on four, had four stories. Okay. The Levy Brothers Mercantile Business occupied all four stories and by 1897, they employed over 400 workers. This photo is rem reminiscent of a Victorian clothier's workers. Abraham Levy was a son of Prussian immigrants and was born here in Houston. He left Foley's to open up his own business and retired at a very old age, never having done anything else but mercantile work. I just really love looking at this picture. All right, we're in the 1890s. Whoa, we're, we went from 9,000 to 27,000 people here. What's going on with that? Now we're gonna have department stores. People have more leisure time. Stephen Hogg is elected governor in this decade and our own Miss Ima serves to assist him with public duties. Lawyer John Henry Kirby moves to Houston from Tyler and buys that large Victorian house, which still stands at Smith and Gray. O.M. Carter comes to uh, Houston from Nebraska and brought the trolley system, bought two trolley systems and upgraded our transportation from mule drawn trolleys to electric trolleys. Houston's industry included 160 plants employing 5,000 workers on a payroll of over $2 million. And a second opera house opened in Houston, the Sweeney and Combs Opera House. So if you were to walk into the Cayenne building, you may see any of the homemakers walking the aisles purchasing ready-made clothing. 
This clothing store was built on the corner of Main and Preston and is still there today, as you can see in the picture on the right. Thanks to the preservation efforts of architects like Barry Moore, it was the first structure with an elevator in Houston and is one of our lasting treasures. I don't know how many of you have been to the awesome last concert cafe, either for wonderful Mexican food or for a concert. But when I was do, doing research, the um, owner, Don Fudge, came up to the table once when I was there and told me that she had discovered a trunk in their attic when they were doing a renovation in which was the entire history of the Alderetti family, their home and pictures of their life when they lived there. The building right there is a very old building. First, the bones of it were first built there in 1848 and this is at 1403 Nance. Slightly north of our bustling downtown on Nance Street, the bones of this building were first constructed in 1848. By the end of the 1880s, the Alderetti family from South America had joined the ranks of Houston's success stories. They lived in this house, raised a family, and ran a restaurant. The owner of the last concert cafe, Don Fudge, discovered a trunk, and I already told you that, but that was just an incredible find. Louisa and Helena Aldrete are dressed in fine, high-colored lace dresses, high-colored lace dresses, <laughs> with touring hats, lavishly decorated with lace, silk, and netting, the perfect attire with which to promenade. Now imagine promenading in an outfit like that on a hot, sultry Houston night. And where would you go? You'd go somewhere like this. You'd go to Highland Park. Highland Park was a favorite destination and close destination for Houstonians to enjoy. There was a dance pavilion similar to the one found further south in La Port boat rides and wooden amusement rides for the children. And the most popular ride at that time was Shoot the Chute, where one slides down a steep grade straight into the water. Pretty busy night. Here's one of the heroes when it comes to public parks. <clears throat> there were civic view leaders who saw the future and created such wonderful city parks as Sam Houston Park is today. It's still right in the middle of our downtown. Mayor Samuel Brashear, while in office, saw the need for public area where our citizens swim, picnic, and beat the heat of a Texas summer. He appointed the first park committee to oversee the planning of a city park that was built on land purchased from the Noble Estate in 1899. The 20 acre spot was landscaped into a Victorian style village, into a Victorian style village with footpaths leading across the bridge that traversed a small stream. In the summer, there was, they're said to have been over 4,000 visitors, which was a good portion of Houston's 27,000 residents. Okay, we're in the 1900s now. Okay, our population went from 27 to 44,000 people. And telephone customers in Houston now numbered 2017. Unions were being formed, the plumbers, carpenters, and building trade unionists engaged in successful strikes and the stenographer's union was formed. William Marsh Rice is murdered was is murdered in Houston, New York, and Galveston Island is devastated by a storm with winds in excess of 100 miles per hour and 15 foot tidal waves. Galvestonians begin moving to Houston. Life in Houston got better and better. Our population doubled and local industry featured 210 manufacturing establishments producing goods over six worth over six million dollars. The Rice Hotel on your left now is called the Rice Lofts, still stands in the center of Houston 
And if those walls could talk, it would be quite a story. This very spot where the first Republic of Texas Capitol was located has continually been occupied with a building that, that then became the Capitol Hotel and now the Rice Lofts. What a, what a great thing. On a personal note, my son and daughter-in-law were married and had their reception in the Crystal Ballroom and it still is marvelous. <sighs> Okay, who doesn't love Vincent's and Nino's and um, Patronella's? Well, because of some Italian immigrants that came to Houston early on, it is common to find descendants of early immigrants still present in Houston today and through the decades involved in the same family business. Sammy Patronella, owner of the Patronella's on Jackson Hill, descends from turn of the century resident John Palazzo. John Palazzo is in the picture below on the same property where Vincent's is today. John owned the shotgun house on West Dallas from which he left every morning to sell golf kerosene to his 15 mile customer radius. The land still remains in the family and now houses the phenomenal Vincent's restaurant. Houstonians have never been all work and no recreation. We've embraced our relationship to the Gulf of Mexico and all the bayous which connect us. The earliest Houstonians saw the need for a deeper passage up to the foot of Main Street to help business in Houston thrive. Decades later, Houstonians put their shoulders to the grindstone and what is now known as the International Port of Houston is a result of so many dedicated individuals and connects us to the world. Now this is the, I, this picture is in here because it is so awesome how every single family collection has a picture of their home in snow. It was so unusual at the time still pretty unusual. When this picture was taken, the same day the Galveston Daily, Daily News headline read, business is suspended, car traffic is completely stopped, banks and wholesale houses closed their doors. It does look pretty, it does look pretty cold. So the gentle, this, this picture, the very last picture, shows the gentle female members of TW House. Sitting on the porch right now is Ruth Nicholson House with her granddaughter. Sitting on the lawn is the renowned author Molly McDowell. Her published journal makes for an excellent read. And I'd like to end my presentation with more words from James Gogan. I am just thrilled that we have his, his 24 page narrative of what it was like. One other, pleasant, one other pleasant occupant of the home I wish to mention is Mrs. M.A. McDowell, Aunt Molly, a beautiful and popular woman, especially among the children. They worshiped her, a fine musician, a counterpart to her sister, Mrs. House. I trust she reached the heights she expected. She told me heaven to her was like a seat in a circus, one above the other, top seats occupied by musicians. My prayer is she's there today playing the piano. So I hope you all have experienced tonight the sweet side of Houston in the second half of the 1800s. Thank you for coming, thank you for listening. And I cannot wait to read your comments. And uh, I appreciate all of you very, very much. <laughs>